go ahead and get ourselves started again. Welcome back to the second half of session two. What we've been playing around with so far is just getting started placing some mm -hmm. elements, placing them on a grid, and we're going to just kind of just keep on working on variations of that theme. If you go to, oh, in the outline, what's going on there? The big things we did was we were, uh, we created the Revit families after we created the grid, using family types and placing the images in select points. And you have to be very careful to make sure it was a nice flat list of points. Uh, make sure that it worked right. Um, next we have the setting of the element parameters. We used element set parameter by name, and it was always, for the element, you can either give it a family or an instance. If you give it a family of elements, it'll change all the elements, kind of like in Revit, when you change the family parameters, it changes everything. If you give a specific list of um, elements, specific instances, it'll only change them. Okay? And you'll see that eventually we're going to start doing things like taking that list of elements and subdividing it into ones we want to change, ones we don't want to change, based on different criteria. But anything you feed it, it'll change whatever parameter. We discovered, many of us discovered that it's very specific about the naming, it's double quotes and precise on the casing. So it has to match this exactly. Okay? And it's easy to do value. Now, I'm going to distinguish what we did there with placing these explicit families that are placed by a single point by this next operation, which is going to be placing adaptive components. Adaptive components are really components that get placed with multiple points. Okay? And it's really very cool because you get that ability to deform things to really just change and adapt to any shape that you feed it. Okay, but it means that as we're feeding it elements, we can't just go ahead and feed it a single thing. We have to feed it several different points and little groups of points to sort of make it make sense to it. Okay, let me go ahead and see if I can get that little uh, video thing started again. If not, I'll just close it up. Where'd my little window go? There it is. We're back over here. Okay, let's just let that be. I was messing around with my screen resolution, trying to improve what's going up on the screen. Oh, that's the problem. We'll see. Okay. When we're placing adaptive components, again, the big thing you're going to see that's the difference is, as opposed to going through and placing single points, we're going to go through and try to compute some different points. So what we're going to do is actually take a model and get a couple different curves and make a list of those curves. And then what we're going to do is do some computation. Based on the model we're going to have, it's going to be some curves that define sort of a roof profile. We're going to say we're going to put some trusses to support that roof. It's kind of a curving roof, okay, adaptive trusses. And to do that, we're going to figure out how many trusses we want. We're going to place some points along the curve, so indicating where the trusses will be placed along these little uh, geometry-defining curves. Then group the points to sort of indicate all the points that would place a single truss. And then finally, place the adaptive component. So it's kind of like three big steps in there. Again, always getting something, computing something, and doing something. But if you go over to 2.2, 2, let me close up out of here. And I will open up instead Revit file 2.2. You'll see what we have in mind. So we'll go out there and open. Two point two. You see this file is a little more interesting. This actually is going to look like a little house. It's actually the Revit sample house. So some of you may be familiar with that if you've been looking at things in Revit a lot. If you zoom on in there, let me show you a couple of different things. Notice right now that okay, there are these little trusses over the main area of the house. You'll notice also there are three little green lines. Those are model curves, which are defining the shape of the roof. There's one over on the left side, one in the middle, and one in the right. And if I come through and orbit, you might be able to see those a little bit better. You see the little curves right there? Let me zoom on in. So again, 
what I'm looking at is there's one just right along here. There's one across the middle. And there's one over here. We're going to use those three curves. Those three curves are really going to define where the roof is and where the trusses are going to be. And what we're going to do is I'm going to let the one on the left and right stay there because we want the roof to be right down to the edge. That's kind of about right. But for this middle one, I'm going to choose that curve. You can see it has like a little control point here. And I can sort of bow that up if I want to and make it as much bowier. Now, as I bow that on up and bring a little green line up to the top, this is existing trusses. Now, per what you guys discovered at the break, the old trusses don't go away. They stick around. So I'm going to take out the old trusses just so that when the new trusses are created, they are not bothered. I can grab them. There's actually a very flat one right there. I'm just kind of control flicking to get these. You can also select all instances. Oh, that'd be a very good idea. A little bit of right clicking and say select all instances in the project. That's a nice way to do it. Grab them all. Delete to get rid of them. Okay, so now I just have the curves there, and I'm going to put some trusses there. So again, I got these three different curves. Those are my defining lines. I'm going to have to choose those. And I'm going to say how many trusses. Okay, and based on how many trusses, what it's going to do is divide up this curve into a number of different segments, put points on those curves that I can then group together and say use those as placement points. Okay, so. Let's go back over to Dynamo and see how that all works. I'll open up Dynamo, and if you go to 2.2, we should be able to get this. <clears throat> okay, so it all starts with, I have a number of different sort of blocks all set up here, different little groups. The first one's going to be all about selecting and defi uh, defining model lines in Revit. Then I'm going to specify the number of trusses to create in its own little block. Then I'm going to divide the lines, these model lines, to create these truss placement points. So what I'm going to do is, based on the number of trusses here, I'm going to break those lines into that many segments. Okay, so if I say nine points, I want nine points along the line. And that's going to be really great. Then we have to do a little transpose, because what I want to do is regroup the points so the first matches the first matches the first and the second matches the second matches the second on the three lines as opposed to being on the lines. Okay. Finally, at the tail end of all this, it is pretty straightforward. What we do there is finally we just go through and take the points and we feed them into adaptive component by points as opposed to like a, was it element by points or a family or family points. You just feed adaptive components. So this is an adaptive component. And what it wants is, as opposed to a single point for everything, it wants little groups of points. And this is what's known as a three-point truss or three placement points. So it'll take little groups of three. Okay. But you're going to find out we have four and five and six placement point things. Next time, we're actually going to learn how to define our own little adaptive pieces. Okay. But for now, we'll work with this little one that just has the three points in it. Okay. So let's go back on over. Our life starts with just selecting some model elements. So as opposed to grabbing them all, I want to select some specific ones. And how we do that is with select model element. It's one of the nodes we have available. And what you do is when you have that available, you say that you want to select an element. And then this grays out, and then we go over to Revit and see if I can find it. And what I'm looking for is the model line on the left side. Now, what happens in Dynamo is it'll actually confirm that element, even that model line has unique IDs. So it's element 100 and 1551. I'll get the middle one, and I'll get the other one. So I'm just going to select them all. You don't have to do that. I've already selected them. But what I'm doing is just getting these three different lines and the one on the right hand side. You might have to tab to get the model line, not the wall. Okay, so I have three different lines. Now, three different lines is kind of okay, but I'd rather than trying to do things with three different separate lines, I'd like to just put them together into a little bit of a list. That way I can operate them on, on them in the same way. So that's what create list is all about. You run it. 
can actually sort of even see over here in my preview area, there's these different lines which are sort of representing the shape in the background there. And you can see I have a list of these three different lines. Okay. And that's just you know, something to work with, uh, go ahead and grab them. The listing, if we need to create a list of four points or five points, is pretty easy. All you gotta do is just click the little plus button and you add some more. I'll take those last ones out. Notice this, this is one of those things that sort of haunts you about Dynamo. It's a zero-based system. So L the first element is element zero, okay? A lot of programming languages that work that way, so watch out for that. This next thing, you'll see we have a bunch of curves right now that we do is we try to pull out the geometry. And this sounds, I don't even have like, oh, it's hard to explain why we have to do this. But what I want to do is not get the model curve, but I want to get the underlying geometry that defines that. And that sounds really vague and obtuse right now. But trust me, you have to do it for now. Which is pulling the geometry out, which gives us a list of nerves curves, non-uniform rational least lines, okay, which makes sense for all the geometry geeks. Okay. Um, is pulling out the curves, and then as I'm going to operate on them, I have to do this little flatten, and what is the flatten all about? The flatten is like what we did before. You see how in each piece of geometry, there could have been several curves that defined it, there's only one, but if I really want to just be three curves, not three items that each contain a curve, I have to flatten it. So that's a whole list flattening thing. And if you take a look at what's happening in there, you'll see what that does, is it pulls out the higher level, outdents everything, I have three curves. That's what I wanted. Take care. See you later. Okay, so I got three curves. You got three curves? Yep. Okay, excellent. Next up, we have the number of trusses you'd like to create. Go ahead and drag that slider, three, four, five, whatever you like. For the slider, just so you know, again, you can always pull down and sort of adjust. I'm going to add a little integer slider here. I'm going to throw a whole number. Okay, and we're ready to pull on over. In my next little section of this, what I'm gonna do is divide the curves, divide those little lines to put those points on them. So what I wanna do is actually go through and based on the number of points, kind of create a series of values from zero to one that has that number of increments, or that number of points along the way. So this goes zero to one to X. In this case, X is really Maybe it'd be more accurate for me to type it in this way. I'll say just the number trust points. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do is just pull that across. And when I run that, what it does is it creates this little series. It creates this little series that goes 0, 0 0.125 all the way to 1. What that is, is it's relative locations along that curve, where zero is the very beginning of the curve, one is the very end of the curve. So rather than computing absolute lo uh, locations, it's giving you a relative placement on each of those curves. And the nice thing about that is, if the curves are slightly uneven in their lengths, that's still okay. Those relative locations will always make sense. So what we're gonna do is say, okay, if these are the relative locations going from 0 to 1, and it wants some curves, okay, I want to take those curves and these relative locations and put a bunch of points at all those locations. Notice it's a little cross product, and that's because I have three curves and like nine points, and I don't want shortest and I don't want longest. I want nine points on each of the three curves. So go ahead and pull down your curves. You have your nine points coming together. Let me go back to my little background here so you can sort of see. What happened? And what you should get now is actually three different groups of nine points. 
You didn't get the points? Let's take a look. What do we got? You got curves. Oh, we have to pull in the number. It just doesn't have the number connected yet. Okay, now I'll run it. And that gives you those. And now you should have a bunch of groups and see other points over there. Okay, thank you. Excellent. We're looking good? Yep. Excellent. Now, when we're placing, here's the deal. You have three groups of nine points. What you really want are nine groups of three points. Because every truss wants three different points that are divided. I'm going to match these three, those three, those three. I'm going to match them that way. So I have to say, hey, take my three groups of nine and just reorient it. Give me nine groups where the first element of each list is grouped, the second element of each list is grouped, and that's what transpose does. So what transpose does is it will take item zero, item zero, item zero. Super. Item one, item one, item one. And that'll give us this array. So all it does is it rotates it over. So as opposed to nine groups of three, it takes the first element from all three groups, the second, the third, all the way down to nine different groups that have three of them. Super. So now we're in great shape. Because I got points where I can place something, so we're ready to start placing. I'm just going to pull down and rev it too, see what that's looking like in the background. You'll see it's also previewing in Revit. You can see it's got those different points located along those lines. And again, what I'm going to do is as follows. I'm going to take something and I'm just going to join this one to this one to that one. I'm going to join this one to this like that. You kind of just make these trusses that go across and kind of uh, go that way as opposed to uh, the current way. Okay, for placing those adaptive components, those multi-point ones, we are so close to what we need. You come on over to the side here. Often what I'll do, let me just do this, I'll switch to the background here and do a little orbit for a second. So I can see better. Often what I'll do is, you know, I've got points, I'm going to put some adaptive components in there. Sometimes it's a little hard to guess exactly what's going to happen or to tell why some things happen. So a good way to start is by visualizing, if you've got a bunch of points, just draw a curve along those points. It just helps you sort of see, am I getting the approximate behavior I want? And to do that, what I'll do is I'll just take those points and say, hey, let's do a curve by points. And when I run that, you'll see what I get is just a bunch of curves. In this case, it's a polyline curve, which just means that it is not very smooth. It's made of a bunch of different little line segments. So there's poly curves by points. Let me get another one for you that's even better looking, though. Curve, an endpoint, an iso curve. Let me try this. Nerves curve by control points. It's another curve. Try this one, see if it's any better looking. Oh, I didn't like that. By control points, I gotta think about which one do I wanna use. By knots. I'm always a little stuck about which one to use. I would want that to be. What's it complaining? It's complaining about something. It must have at least one or more control points than degrees. Oh, that's interesting, since it only has, it's interesting, it may not work because there's only like three points there. Okay, forget that comment right now. <laughs> it worked with our sine wave the other day. Yeah. Okay. Now, if those curves look like approximately the location where you want to have those trusses, you are ready to say, great, take those points, and notice how they're in groups of three. Okay. This thing wants groups of three, so you're going to be in good shape. Again, one of those things where always look at the way it's grooved as you're feeding it. If you have a problem at this point, it's typically just because 
either you're too flat or you're too inflated. It's like somehow we gotta get the level, the hierarchy the same. And when you come on down and bring that in to the points over here and run that, you should get some nice looking trusses. These are kind of squarish trusses. We can put some nice rounded trusses in there too. What will happen now is, and this is where you get a sort of a design automation advantage, if you keep on changing that and you rerun that, it'll update. Now, notice they updated me for me here. That's because they were created in the same session, so it understood that they came out of the script. If they were here when we opened it, it wouldn't understand. It kind of keeps everything in sync. So that's really where you get one of the big disadvantages of doing things programmatically like this is really, you know, it's not so much that I care about having a truss that's exactly five feet tall. What I really want is a truss that's going to hit that roof line no matter where the roof line met or was. And that's, that's what I mean sort of about in terms of really encoding what your design intent is. Your design intent is follow the roof wherever the roof goes. It's not really a specific distance. So we're going to do a lot of things like that, like that in terms of just working with like uh, adaptive components. We're going to do the same sorts of things where we have wall surfaces or roof surfaces, and we'll divide them up into groups of points on the surface and then place things all over, kind of adaptive behavior of all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but that's it. So things when you place tend to either go down as either place them as individual points or place them as groups of adaptive points. So either explicit or whatever. But super, you're in good shape. Okay, let's pull you back to another example. Let's give you a little bit more to chew on. It's one that I call parametric towers. Parametric towers is sort of like the first example. It's really, we're gonna put a line of points out there, we're gonna put a bunch of little tower objects down. Okay, so we're gonna compute some placement points, then we're gonna place some families on that. And then we're gonna set the parameters. In this case, we can set the height of the, of the uh, towers based on uh, like the media value that we want to put in there. But in the second part, what we're going to do is sort of combine our math with that, where we can compute a little bit of a sine wave, and then based on where the towers are, have the tower heights change, do they follow a sine wave? Okay. So let's get an open up 2.3, and we'll take a look at that one. So head on over to 2.3. Come back over here. Okay, go ahead and get that example parametric towers. I got a bunch of different little tower shapes in there. It's a nice big empty field, okay, but that's okay. And then let's go over to Dynamo and we'll take a look in there. We'll open that up. Again, go to 2.3. You'll see in this one, I have to have several different Dynamo files for you. What I tend to do is if I have multiple steps, I'll give you one and two. A is getting started but not wired together. B is typically end. Okay, so you, if something gets lost along the way, you can jump back in. So let's start with 1A. So I'm going to compute some tower placement points. I'm going to go from 0 to 1,000 and have a value at every 200. So 0, 200, 400, 600. Okay. Then I'm 
I'm going to put some coordinates in there. I'm going to let this be my x coordinate <coughs> or my y coordinate. It could be at 100, it could be at 0, it doesn't really matter. Z, I'm also going to put it at 0, so they're all on the ground. So what's happening here is if I run this one so far, first part's just getting my grid. So you'll see there's 0 to 1,000. What I'll do is those are going to be my x coordinates. My y is at 100, my z is at 0. So if I run this, I should just get a whole series, like six different points there. Okay, let's see if you get that part. If you have that part, we're going to take our family, our twisting rectangular mass family, okay, and just pull those points in. Since that point loop is flat, we should be good. It's not a grid. If it was a grid, we'd have to flatten it. I'm learning. So pull on down to your point. Okay, and now go ahead and run that. Let's see what's going on in the background there. Doesn't look like much is happening. What's going on here? I got points, I got families. Missing points in the Z axis. Missing points in the They're all at zero? Or what? So again, here. Oh, they're just over there somewhere. <laughs> well, that could happen easily. Let's go back over to my geometry. Oh, there they are. They're way over there somewhere. OK, my grid's a little small relative to what's going on there. Not to worry. Let's go back over to Revit and try zoom to fit over there. So go to Revit and say type Z up and zoom to fit. Now you see a bunch of them. You'll see there's a bunch of points. So once you get to Revit, say Z up. Now you should see a bunch of them. Super. And you'll see they're all kind of hanging around in here. That's looking pretty good. You know, again, at this point, we can go through and adjust some of the parameters. If you choose one of those, we can set parameter. Let's see what we got available on this twisting tower. We have the building height, so I can make one like 400 feet tall. I have, oh, there's something about the base width. I can make that 100. I can make the base top. These are all just different little parameters to play with. Just a bunch of different little tower shapes. So these are the parameters I'm available to play with. So you even have twists, but we'll leave that one alone for right now. So if I want to go through and set some parameters, what I have to do is just use that same set command. So let's see if I have them in here. So if you go on over just to the right in that script, You'll say I have some set some tower parameters. What was I was doing? I was doing the building base width, but you could really change whatever it is that you want in there. Here I'm using string, which is a function. That's very much like code block. It's just a string value. That was the old way of doing it. Now people tend to do it in code block. But I'll take my instances across and whatever you want. If you want to go through and change, what was it? Let's say building height. If you use this, it's understood as being a string, so you don't have to go through and put the quotes on it. So I can choose the numeric slider. I'll make them all taller and run that. Now, interestingly, you might notice that I had done some customization on some of them. So it did reset the value that I wanted to reset. I told it to reset, but the other ones it kind of kept. And sort of, that's OK. Yeah. You don't change everything, you only change the variables that you're changing. So that's the first part. Just put them on out there and string them on out. Okay. The second part of this example though is what if we actually use a little math to do something? So what I thought about is could we go through and use a sine wave to have those things kind of bounce up and down and kind of follow like a sine pattern based on the x values. So to do that, there's like a couple of different things. Here's the basic um, organization of how the logic flows. 
We're going to go through and compute some sine wave values to be based on the x value. Okay. So we could say, hey, x, that's considered like a certain number of radians. Let's compare it to the radians and do a sine of it. Okay. But when you do sine waves, there's some things you want to think about. Often when you want to do sine waves, there's, well, there's even a third one that I didn't put in there. There's the whole, what I'll call the wave frequency. Okay. That's how often the troughs occur versus the high points occur. There's the wave amplitude. Is it a relatively flat wave? Is it a very tall wave? And also, there's a wave baseline. And the reason I go through and put that in there is the wave baseline is kind of necessary when we're using um, sine waves in geometry in that we don't like zeros, or we don't like negative heights. Okay. So you just sort of raise the minimum up to some height so that the wave will be higher and lower than that. Okay. So we do that, we compute some sort of height value, then we say, let's just element set parameter by name to the height and fill that value in. So let's take a look at what that looks like. If you go back over to Dynamo, and instead of this one, go ahead and open up to A, okay. the first part of this looks just the same. Nothing's changed over here. We got our start value, our family, our family by the point. That's all okay. Where it sort of starts getting interesting is where we start computing the heights. And what I have going on here, okay, it was the initial sort of set the parameter value, is I have a little block right here, which is all about computing a sine wave. And there's several different values in there. What I have over here is it's going to start with some number that will interpret as radians and change that to degrees. And we're going to do the sine of that. Okay, So that's going to give us some values anywhere from negative 1 to positive 1, something like that. What we have is we have an amplitude. The amplitude okay, lets us go through and take uh, the, whatever the sine value is and multiply it by a value, okay, and that'll give us just sort of a bigger value. It'll go from like, you know, minus 100 to plus 100. So it'll be easier to see, because, you know, plus or minus one, not so easy to see on a building. Okay. Then I have the base height. We'll add that in. That'll just sort of move the middle of the wave up and down. Okay. So that's the whole idea behind this. And if you do that, what you can do is, well, let's just kind of start putting the plumbing together. I'll start by getting all those different x values. The x values are actually coming right out of this code block. <clears throat> okay, so if we run that, for example, see there's some sort of different degrees in there. We get some sine values that come out of that. Okay. What I'm going to do is take those sine values and multiply them by 100. Let me see what that looks like. So you're going to see I'm going to get everything from, let's zoom on in here. Everything from 0 to minus 87, minus 85, plus 4, plus 89, plus 82, we'll start kind of cycling through. Okay, let's take a look. Ultimately, you're going to add the base in there. Let's see what your specific error is. Okay. Yeah, because it, it just has to be <coughs> x value variables. Just the x values. Okay. Looking good, looking good. We're multiplying. Excellent. Now add the base in there too, just so we can kick the wave. So as it goes minus 87 to like plus, or minus 100 to plus 100, it'll be varying off some base. Okay, when you run that, you'll see what you're going to get is a series of values. 349, 260, 353, 438, 432. So it's starting to sort of, you know, just play. So the point of all this is whenever you start dealing with a sine wave, always be thinking about just, uh, you always have just three different things. The frequency, which is how close the troughs are together. 
the amplitude, okay, and also the base. Let's zoom on out. Okay, and now we can take those values and just use those right over here. I've got the values. I need to take the elements and the building height. And if I run that now, what should happen is I should get a lot of points. In this case, what happened was because that script was independent of these things like created the mean last time, there were two on top of each other. What I should do is delete those other ones using Andrew's trick. Just like right click and say select all instances. I like that. There's my points. I'll run that. And you can start to see the variation in those things. Now, I don't have the frequency in here, but I keep on talking about it being another potential error. So the other thing that you do with frequency is you'll take the values that you're feeding in, you'll divide by the frequency, and that will make them either closer or further apart. Okay, just sort of sort of see the sine wave here, but if you want to see it more up and down, more peaky, you can. Or, in this case, since it's working pretty good here, if it worked for five, you could just as easily say, you know, hey, I'm going to go not just to a thousand, I'm going to go to five thousand and run that. And then you'll just get a whole lot more of them. So you can see the sine wave a little bit better. Okay. Interesting way to design a city. Okay. Stranger things have been done. Okay. As we're finishing up today, let me point you to two other examples you may want to take a look at and something that will give you just as uh, something to play with if you want to over the weekend, just to kind of get some practice in under your belt. Okay. The last two examples, I'll do the one with the windows next time together with you. If you want to take a look at attractor cubes, where we actually thought we'd come into it, we didn't quite get to this time. What's going to happen is it's the same sort of thing as we did last time. We put the family instances down, like we did in our first example. We compute some sort of attractive force, okay, some sort of value based on how close we are to the other scale. Okay. And then finally, we're just setting the parameter. We're setting a height parameter or a width parameter just based upon that attractive force. So you can take a look at that in 2.5. It'll give you some guidance about why they do that. We'll take a look at it next time together. But what I want to do for people who are kind of keen to sort of practice and sort of play with this stuff is introduce something else to you. What I'm doing is I'm starting to throw in to the folders just a whole series of what I'll call practice exercises. And these aren't graded. These aren't assignments that you have to done. But they're just sort of things that sort of give you a chance to sort of play around with what we've been talking about today. So. This is one that we gave as an assignment last time. We called it Ripples on the Pond. It really is a variation on the whole attractor thing, where in this case, I'm saying what would happen if you dropped a pebble in water, and you could sort of picture the waves rippling out. Okay? So we'll use the sort of attractor logic and compute some heights, but the height we'll do won't just be based on your distance. It'll be based on a sine wave that's coming out. So the further you are away, you start to have these ripples that sort of occur based on sort of how far you are in the sine wave. Okay, there's a lot of variations in here. It starts with creating the rectangular grid, putting an attractor point to represent the pebble, adjusting the heights. That's all okay. There's some other things that I put out there that just yes, to kind of keep you going if you're interested to think about. You know, if you want to, if we were really modeling the real system, those ripples would probably diminish as you got further and further away. So it's not really a sine wave. You could almost think about taking whatever value you get and dividing it so that it gets less and less, what the effect is the further away you get. Okay. And finally, if you're really in for some fun, think about what would happen if you dropped two or three different pebbles in there. And what happens when the waves start overlapping with each other? 
And that actually sparked quite a debate last year in class in terms of really what the effect of that would be. Do you add them together? Do you just take the maximum? You've got to think about what that should be. It's kind of an interesting little physical phenomenon to think about. But again, this is here more just for fun to play with. If you sort of think you got it, but you'd like to sort of get a chance to exercise it and sort of think about what it is, yeah, have at it. But it's not going to be collected, although we will talk about it on Monday or on Tuesday. So you know, if you have done it and stuff like that, we'll take a look at it. You know, yeah, just set down. Good stuff to whatever. The more practice you get, the better. Cool. Okay. Let us adjourn for today then. And I'll also get you a syllabus because I know you want to start planning ahead yeah. to when those things are going to happen too.